Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and yesterday my dear friends from Austria uploaded a video interview that they did live in Austria, in Vienna, with Jeffrey Sachs. And it is part of this uh, big peace conference that was organized there, was done in conjunction with my colleague Fritz Edlinger, who is the chief uh, the editor-in-chief of the Austrian magazine International, a wonderful magazine. If you read German, I highly recommend subscribing to them and also subscribe to their YouTube channel. They do a fantastic job. The interview with uh, Dr. Sachs was done by my friend and colleague, uh, with whom I've published books together and articles, Dr. Professor Heinz Gertner. And I would just recommend you watch this uh, one hour long discussion between the two and all the explanation that uh, Jeffrey Sachs gives. He's a fantastic speaker and he views world politics and US politics very, very clearly. Please enjoy. So I uh, wrote to uh, Professor Sachs uh, we have uh, several explanations here out there. So starting from uh, Putin's uh, personality uh, to uh, imperial conquest to more structural uh, explanations like uh, hegemonic uh, comp competition. So you have this range of explanations. So where would you stand? Is it personality? Uh, is it imperialism? Uh, is it more hegemonic uh, competition or great power competition, uh, as we say? It. So that's the first question. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm told to be very brief so that we can discuss a lot. So I'll give uh, somewhat brief answers, because if I get going, it's going to be a long evening for you. Um, I believe the war started nine years ago, not last year. <clears throat> I think it started in February 2014. It started with the violent overthrow of President Yanukovych, uh, which I attribute to a significant extent to US uh, participation in a regime change operation in Ukraine. And to my mind, that uh, really was the trigger of this war, uh, meaning that we are basically seeing a uh, a proxy war between the United States and Russia, plus both sides uh, uh, playing on the very aggravated ethnic divisions within Ukraine. So Ukraine is a divided uh, country, ethnically, historically, but uh, that meant that there was competition between the United States and Russia for control for influence, uh, even for putting military bases and the US-NATO alliance. And I view the lack of prudence by both sides. But since I'm an American, I will focus on the lack of American prudence as being absolutely central to this. If the United States had sense, and by the United States, I don't mean the American people. They're never asked about any of these things. This has nothing to do with the American people. This is to do with a small group in Washington in power. Uh, you could call it the military industrial complex. It's a fair name for it. Uh, they don't have prudence. Uh, and uh, we are at war because of that lack of prudence, in my view. I don't think anything specific about Putin's personality plays any important role in this. Uh, I don't think that this is uh, some idea of recreating the Russian Empire. By the way, we hear lots of things in the mainstream media, which to my mind are completely unrecognizable uh, regarding the truth. And just one more small point, I was advisor economic advisor to President Gorbachev. I was economic advisor to President Yeltsin. And I was an economic advisor to President Kuchma, the first president of independent Ukraine. I didn't choose sides. I liked them both. There's no reason why this war needed to happen. Uh, but 
I'll focus because of being an American on the lack of sense of the military industrial complex in the United States. And I think that that was a major, major cause of this war. Um, you said personality doesn't really play that role. So uh, you mentioned uh, NATO and uh, probably you said structural causes and hegemonic Absolutely. competition. And of course, uh, uh, Russia's perception is that the, Russia wanted to wall off uh, NATO. So uh, he was not really uh, successful because now NATO is uh, everywhere. So NATO, uh, Finland and Sweden are joining NATO and uh, NATO troops are permanently deployed in Poland and the Baltic States. Right now we have a huge military, NATO military maneuver in uh, Germany and also Putin wanted to demilitarize uh, Ukraine and now uh, Ukraine is uh, the most militarized country uh, in Europe. Was Putin's decision a big geopolitical blunder? Well, it's a big geopolitical tragedy. Uh, what happens from now uh, still remains to be seen. And let me be clear about the NATO issues. It's my, uh, well, it's, it's without doubt uh, the American plan to expand NATO to Ukraine uh, already in the mid-1990s, well before there was Putin uh, as president. It is my understanding from a discussion with one of our leading historians recently that the plan to expand NATO to Ukraine was made in 1992, uh, basically within weeks or months of having promised uh, Gorbachev that NATO would not move one inch eastward. So this is not something new. It's not something about uh, Putin. It's something that predates Putin. There's a fascinating article by Zbigniew Brzezinski in Foreign Affairs magazine, which is our establishment foreign policy magazine in 1997, where he spells out the timeline to NATO enlargement to Central Europe, Eastern Europe, the Baltic States, and Ukraine almost precisely in 1997, because this was a US plan at the top levels. When an article is written like that, that's not just an opinion of an author, that's informing the elite opinion in the United States what the real plan is. So this was in the works for decades. And uh, the specific idea about NATO, spelled out by Brzezinski both in Foreign Affairs and in a book called The Global Chessboard that he wrote in 1997, is to surround Russia in the Black Sea region. Uh, this is out of the playbook of Britain and France in 1853 to 1856. It's almost reliving the Crimean War. The idea of the Crimean War was that Palmerston wanted to kick Russia out of the Black Sea. Brzezinski had a similar idea in the mid-1990s. The US neoconservatives had a similar idea back to 1992. If Ukraine and Georgia become NATO members, then if you look at the map, you see that Russia is surrounded by Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia. Even the idea of expanding NATO to Georgia, to me, is the giveaway. Last time I checked, Georgia is not a North Atlantic country. It's in the Caucasus. What in heaven's name, is NATO doing in Georgia? This is where things really went awry. It is official US doctrine. It's surprisingly official, by the way, because you can find it in many, many documents that the US goal is to be the dominant power in all parts of the world. To my mind, no thanks. 
That doesn't make me feel any safer. It just means endless wars when 4.1% of the world population presumes that it's going to dominate the world. But this, I believe, was part of U.S. foreign policy at the core already for decades. And NATO enlargement is part of this. There's something particular about Ukraine. It is 2,000 kilometers of border with Russia. It is, from Russia's point of view, a direct security risk to Russia. I would take the same view uh, as a Russian, and I would take the same view as an American vis-a-vis -vis Russia. I actually don't want Mexico to have a military alliance with China. I don't want Mexico to have a military alliance with Russia. And I don't want the United States to have a military alliance with Ukraine for the same reasons. It doesn't make the world safer. If um, NATO expansion was one of the main uh, causes for the decision uh, by uh, Russia uh, to invade uh, Ukraine because, of course, of the uh, fear that it might be a similar situation as we had to the Cuban Missile Crisis in uh, 62, that NATO uh, missiles would be deployed uh, there. Uh, however, there have been several proposals uh, since uh, 2008. There uh, was the Bucharest summit when uh, NATO promised uh, uh, Ukraine and Georgia to become uh, NATO members, but uh, not later than 2014 for a neutrality uh, of Ukraine. So neutrality defined no NATO membership, but at the same time, the withdrawal uh, of uh, Russian supported militias uh, in uh, in the East. So could have uh, a neutral Ukraine uh, avoided the, the war. Why was it uh, discarded? Uh, of course, since 2019, we know that Ukraine has uh, the NATO membership in its uh, constitution. Uh, before 2008, there was some fourth and back independence neutrality NATO membership. Uh, but not later than 2005, uh, NATO membership was an aspiration by Ukraine. So if Ukraine would have uh, defended a uh, uh, presented a credible neutrality. Could have the war have been avoided? Of course, it, it could have. And Austria's history is a glorious uh, demonstration of the success of neutrality. Uh, Austria was not threatened in the years from 1955 onward by being a non-NATO neutral country. Austria regained its sovereignty, and the Soviet Union went home. And incidentally, the Soviet Union went home in 1955 because not only was the state treaty signed in the Belvedere agreed and the neutrality uh, declared by the parliament of this country, but also the Soviet Union was saying to the United States, do this for Germany, and the Cold War ends. Make Germany neutral. What is this NATO business? This is a threat to us. Germany claimed 20 million lives of our citizens. Why are you rearming Germany? And our greatest statesman, practitioner of the day, one of our great historian diplomats in modern history, George Kennan, said at that moment, use the Austrian example. Have a neutral Germany and tell the Soviet Union, go home, out of Central Europe, out of Eastern Europe. Now you don't need that buffer zone because Germany is neutral. The United States would have nothing of it. The United States has never believed in it. You were lucky. They weren't paying attention. Uh, but. Uh, for Germany, no way. We were going to have NATO. At the end of the 1950s, Eisenhower even said, give them nuclear weapons. That's OK. Uh, and that is why, in a series of horrible events, we nearly arrived at nuclear Armageddon with the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
The United States has a very hard time thinking through the eyes of anyone else. And when I say U.S., I, I'm meaning literally a small group of a few hundred people. I'm not speaking about the American people. They're not told anything about this. And just as a footnote, I've tried to explain the role of NATO in this uh, to the New York Times, and they will not print anything on this. They've written 26 editorials since February 24th, 2022, that this is an unprovoked war. I called them, I wrote to them, I said I've advised all these leaders, these countries, I've been through this for three decades, can you give me 700 words? The answer is no. There's a complete unwillingness to have any discussion about this. Because if you do, you're put on Ukraine's blacklist and you're put on America's no-show list in the mainstream media. It's really quite something. Uh, One more thing sorry, that's wor ahead, worth, worth everybody understanding. This is not about Democrats and Republicans. This is not at all about partisan politics. Biden is no different from so many other presidents. It's not, this one's crazy, this one's not crazy. They're all a little bit, mm. um, but uh, this is about really state policy in the deepest structure in Washington, and it's the Armed Services Committees, it's the very $900 billion military budgets. You have to test your weapons, believe me. You need wars, uh, not so infrequently. You have to be ready, you have to teach China a lesson. In the, in the minds of this small group, this war is as much about China as it is about anything else. Isn't that surprising? It's hard to think the way they think, but you cannot actually discuss this in the United States right now, in the mainstream. Of course, there are a thousand outlets to discuss things, but not in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, MSNBC, CNN, forget it. Let's um, go a step further. You mentioned uh, Austria and compared it to Germany. Austria was lucky, maybe prudent, uh, as you say, uh, to get its permanent neutrality. Germany was permanently uh, divided, if you uh, say it's a several uh, decades. So we know this from history that wars end where the armies stand. So, and then you always have a division. Uh, of territory. So we know this from the end of the Cold War. In, in Tehran, uh, 1943, they decided uh, to build the blocks where basically the armies after the Second World War uh, were uh, deployed. Now we have a situation uh, in a little bit in sort of Iron Curtain, a little bit more east. So we have an Iron Curtain from the Arctis uh, Finland, Sweden is uh, uh, joining uh, NATO, and this Iron Curtain is going right through Ukraine down to the uh, Black Sea. Do you see for Ukraine now a permanent division like for Germany or for Korea? Or do we see a permanent war since I guess permanent neutrality is not the option anymore uh, for Ukraine? I would say we don't know uh, what the options are because there has been no diplomacy between the United States and Russia since this war began. As far as I know, President Biden and President Putin have not spoken one time since February 24th, 2022. I find that worse than school children, by the way. It's hard for me to understand how the world can be at the brink of nuclear war. And I could send them a link if they want so they could get on Zoom. Uh, I could even give them a phone call. I'd lend, lend them my phone. 
it's not so hard. But they don't talk. This is somehow sophisticated. This is absolutely mind-boggling. Of course, you need to talk. You need to understand the other side. Maybe you won't agree. More likely, you'll find a modus vivendi or a modus operandi to get beyond this. It could be, in the end, many things could be. So I don't have a prediction. Ukraine could be divided. We could have nuclear war. We could have uh, Ukraine be neutral uh, and Russia go home from most of Ukraine, though I don't think it's going to leave Crimea for a lot of reasons now. Uh, but lots of things could happen. We should understand that in December 2021, the idea that Russia would un annex the Donbass wasn't mentioned once. What Russia wanted was that the Minsk II agreements would be honored. Now, that's quite interesting. The Minsk II agreement declared that there would be autonomy for the uh, Lugansk and Donetsk, uh, for eastern Ukraine, the Russian dominant ethnic group, signed by Ukraine and voted 15 to nothing by the UN Security Council and guaranteed by France and Germany. You know what my Ukrainian friends, well, they're not, they don't regard me as a friend anymore, but what they tell me, of course we'd never honor that, as if it's a joke. And then when Russia says, well, this was not honored, we say, ah, oh, what difference? Russia doesn't believe in diplomacy. And now the sentence that I just uttered proves that I'm a Putin lover. You know, in other words, we're in a cycle of bizarre arguments. The truth is actually rather straightforward. The United States participated in the overthrow of Yanukovych. A Russophobic government came to power. They immediately declared the intention, immediately means within 2014, to join NATO. Arms shipments from the United States accelerated. The Minsk agreements were signed. The Ukrainian government ignored them. Chancellor Merkel explained afterwards, she explained to us last year, that she ignored them completely. In 2021, December 17, President Putin put on the table a draft U.S.-Russia security agreement, which had two major points that Putin was emphasizing. One is that the Minsk agreement should be carried out. And the second was that NATO would not enlarge. And the United States said, we, we don't negotiate with you over those things. And it's NATO doctrine. What we do is no third country's business. As if uh, Castro said, what business is it of you, United States, just before we invaded in the Bay of Pigs and also nearly had the world blown up over the Cuban Missile Crisis. If the tables are turned just a little bit, believe me the explosion that you would hear of any of the claims that the United States makes. So that kind of hypocrisy and arrogance also is very grating on most of the rest of the world. We make wars when we want. We can invade Afghanistan. We can invade Iraq, we can try to overthrow Assad and have no doubt that was not a civil war. That was a U.S. regime change operation signed by the President of the United States to the CIA called Operation Timber Sycamore. We can overthrow Gaddafi with the NATO in the end of 2011. We can overthrow Yanukovych. We can do what we want. Why are you complaining? We are a peace-loving defensive alliance. And so 
this doesn't work. And this is why we don't know what can happen because I keep claiming, I'll claim it again, President Biden did what a US president should do, first picked up the phone or hit the Zoom button and talked to his counterpart and said, you go home and we won't fill in the void with NATO. Lots of good things could happen. So I don't rule out anything, but it takes two to make a negotiation. Incidentally, one more point, sorry to run on. In March 2022, Russia and Ukraine negotiated an end to the war. Did you know that? They negotiated. What happened? Putin happened. What happened? Putin happened. Excuse me? No, that's not what happened. Okay, Putin may or may not have happened, but that's not what happened at the negotiating table. What happened at the negotiating table was the United States told them, don't negotiate. That's what the United States told them. This is now from multiple directions clear. And if you want to hear a very interesting description of this that shows how bizarre this is, Naftali Bennett, who was then Prime Minister of Israel and an informal mediator, said we were in the seventh draft and they were just about reaching an agreement. And then the United States stopped it. And he said, I don't think they should have stopped it, but they thought it was important about China. Are you kidding? It takes a certain imagination to think that way. But that's what happened. And I've heard that from all sides. So this is really not beyond our reach to have a negotiated outcome to this. Not at all beyond our reach. Let me push a little bit on this. On the one hand, you're saying uh, all options are possible, so you don't know what. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you're saying no, diplomacy does not really work uh, now anymore. So uh, what are the real uh, end result here? So Karl of Clausewitz, he said, a war always pushes to the extremes unless there is a peace agreement or a total defeat of the adversary. Neither is, uh, of these options are inside uh, at the moment. So fighting continues. What are these extremes when it comes on? No diplomacy, decision made on the battlefield. Would it creep to an uh, open, all-out uh, war? Is this a possibility, including maybe nuclear weapons? Or the There are many theories of what's going to happen on the battlefield, but before I get to them, uh, just to say that uh, Clausewitz's most famous uh, observation, I think, applies here perfectly, which is that war is the continuation of politics with other means. This is political issues that we're talking about here, which means that there is a way to resolve these issues politically, not militarily. That's key. If this was the delusions of a madman, this would be different. But this is politics. It's politics about Ukraine, and it's politics about NATO. And so this is susceptible of a negotiated outcome. I would not give up on that at all. Now, what could happen, many things could happen. The one thing that cannot happen, in my opinion, is that Russia is defeated. And the reason is that if Russia were to lose in a conventional sense, I believe Russia would likely escalate to nuclear war. Because my understanding of this issue is that Russia views this issue as existential for Russia, not as haphazard and not as a flight of fancy, not as a dream world of Peter the Great, not as recreating the Russian Empire, but as an existential threat to Russia. 
whether it is or is not, it's viewed that way. And Putin is hardly the hardest of the hardliners in Russia, by the way. Uh, there are many who resent the fact that he has not escalated much harder and much faster, which is within Russia's means. So one possibility is that Russia wins on the battlefield in the next months. This could really happen, incidentally, because in a war of attrition, a much, much larger and powerful country has a propensity to win. And because apparently, although I'm no expert on this, it is said that NATO stockpiles, including U.S. stockpiles, are uh, running very low, that scaling up of U.S. military production will take years, and that even an article in Politico, which is a kind of right-wing uh, daily in the United States, said the Pentagon is freaking out over the depleted reserves because our real war is with China, they say. So it's really possible that Russia has a significant victory on the battlefield. Okay, that could mean all sorts of things. It could mean NATO escalation, uh, in which we ratchet uh, things further, or it could mean that there's some negotiation or frozen lines or armistice or Ukraine divided in two or something else. Okay, that's one possibility. Another possibility is that Ukraine wins significantly in this counteroffensive, although, actually, I won't say although, suppose that it did. Is Russia going to say, oh, we made a mistake, we go home? I doubt it. I think Russia would escalate further. And Russia has 1,600 deployed nuclear weapons, including tactical nuclear weapons. I'm told every day, oh, don't be blackmailed by nuclear weapons. People who say that have no idea of the history of the nuclear age. If you're not terrified of gambling with that, you don't know the history. I'm terrified of it. So if Russia were to be losing in a conventional war, I'd be, I, would be terrified right now of what would come next. And the idea that we had a story last week in the Washington Post, by the way, which said Biden, I don't, I'm paraphrasing, uh, has decided he can ignore more and more of Putin's red lines because so far it's all been bluff. My God. The best book about the Cuban Missile Crisis ever written was a book called Gambling with Armageddon. That's what they're doing. And I know the people doing the gambling, you wouldn't want to bet the world on them, by the way. I know them personally. Don't bet the world on them. So this is where we are. Lots of things are possible. But one thing that is absolutely possible is that Biden picks up the phone and says, you know, we should consider a way to end this thing without blowing up the world, with you going home, and with NATO not enlarging. That's what I would like to see. You said nuclear weapons. Uh, of course, uh, Russia might uh, use or might threaten with uh, nuclear weapons. But at the moment, it doesn't really uh, uh, seem that Russia will have a decisive victory uh, on the battlefield. So wasn't there a Russian miscalculation in the first uh, place? So he did not, Russia did not increase military spending decisively before the war. All other imperial powers did in the history, Russia did not. He invaded Ukraine with 180,000 soldiers. Compared to the U.S., the U.S. Uh, deployed 800,000 soldiers uh, in two, uh, 1992 in uh, Kuwait to liberate Kuwait. 
Kuwait is 40 times smaller than Ukraine. So wasn't it as a, a, a military miscalculation by Putin in the first place? And now the, the last option, uh, what remains are the nuclear weapons. Was this not a, a dangerous gamble, gambling on the side of Putin as well? Aren't we just witnessing a game of chicken on both sides? Isn't that what we're doing, that each side thinks they can bluff the other, and each side calls the bluff of the other? The United States thought that they could get rid of Yanukovych, no consequence. That's what the U.S. thought. It's had, the U.S. has overthrown dozens of governments it's really a bad habit. They forgot diplomacy. What they learned, they think, learned it from the British, by the way, that if you don't like your counterpart, overthrow them. So you forget that there's diplomacy. You don't have to deal with them. You have to subvert them. So they thought that they could overthrow Yanukovych, no consequence. Putin grabbed Crimea like he told George Bush he would. Okay, And the uh, Russian parts of the Ukrainian army broke away in eastern Ukraine, took the weapons with them, and started this, uh, the, the People's Republics of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. And by the way, OSCE observers and NATO observers say this was not Russian weapons coming in. I wasn't there. Uh, it said this was Ukrainian weapons taken from within the Ukrainian army uh, to create uh, these two breakaway regions. That uh, led to the Minsk agreements. Putin thought maybe that will be the way that this will stop. There will be autonomy for these two regions. Crimea will be ours. That would have probably stopped this war. But Minsk wasn't. Uh, Minsk wasn't uh, honored. When President Biden came in, Putin said, stop, you know, stop. And Biden said, no, why stop? We're, uh, Ukraine's going to become a member of NATO. And during 2021, the United States three times signed very high-level documents committing the U.S. to NATO enlargement to Ukraine. On December, and then Putin massed troops on the border and put forward this draft document on December 17th. He thought, I think that would lead to negotiations. I called the White House uh, a week, two weeks after that, spoke to a senior official at length. I said, negotiate, avoid a war, negotiate. It's not even a concession not to expand NATO. It's common sense not to expand NATO. And I was told, no, 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 we'll never negotiate over that. So Putin thought that that would work. It failed. So he launched the invasion on February 24th. What was he expecting then? My view is he was expecting a quick negotiation. Why do I surmise that? Because three weeks later, there was a quick negotiation. Three weeks later, Zelensky said, we don't have to be part of NATO. We can be neutral. Go look it up, ladies and gentlemen. That was Putin's idea. OK, we've shown we mean business. Now we'll have a negotiated outcome based on neutrality. But the US called that bluff, said, no way. We tell our client, you don't negotiate, which is exactly what happened. So they called the bluff. And that, with sanctions and us doubling down, Putin will back off. No, Putin mobilized in the summer of 2021. 300,000 more people. He called the bluff. OK, we'll send tanks and F-16s. We'll call the bluff. Come on. All of us have been in sixth grade. That's what we're witnessing except they're playing with nuclear weapons. This is clear. By the way, not only clear, at least to me, I said exactly this to US officials. 
all through this process because for a while they would even talk to me because I know them. I've been around. And I said, this is, this is deep for Russia. And by the way, all of our best diplomats have said the same thing for 30 years. William Burns, who's very bright and now CIA director, in 2008 was the US ambassador to Russia. He sent a famous memo. The memo is called Niet means Niet. He explained that the entire Russian political class is dead set against NATO enlargement to Ukraine. Niet means Niet. And he said it's no joke. But of course, American politicians don't listen to this. Bill Perry, our defense secretary, said, don't expand NATO. George Kennan said in 2007, no, excuse me, 1997, that this is going to lead to disaster. You can look it up in the New York Times. It's on the website. This is all predictable. They behave like kids. Raytheon lobbies for more sales. All the think tanks in Washington are gung-ho for U.S. unilateral prerogatives. Every article in Foreign Affairs magazine is about what they call U.S. primacy. So it's all about how can we stay number one? As an economist, it's not even a question I ask, by the way. The question an economist asks is how can we have a win-win economy of trade? But if you're a strategist, it's who's on top. That's what counts. To me, it's back to sixth grade. But for them, each side's calling each other's bluff. So where's the miscalculation? Both sides. The only absolute disastrous loser is Ukraine in this. And Ukraine had one president who was trying delicately to avoid being engulfed in a proxy war, and that was Yanukovych, and he was overthrown. I have a couple of more questions before we move on to the current A questions, three more questions about. Uh, just to respond, of course, the Western perception is uh, different. So the Western perception is that Putin abroad war, block thinking, and arms race back to Europe. But it seems that the West is more than willing to accept this Putin's reality as a new norm. We have this keyword Zeitenwende. So it seems to be an agreement that they uh, meet on a much lower level. The higher values like multilateralism, interdependence, uh, arms control, they're all given up uh, also by the West. So it seems that Putin uh, won this narrative. Now we're in a different world. Whoever is responsible, but everybody plays the same game. The very sad thing for me in watching this is how Europe lost its identity as a political union to become part of NATO. <laughs> It, it's something ununderstandable for me, the equation of the EU and NATO. And the fact that President von der Leyen is campaigning to leave the presidency of the European Commission to become head of NATO is an example of how utterly bizarre the situation is. So. I'm, I'm a uh, professor of sustainable development. And that means that I study uh, not only income levels, but quality of life, health, and many other dimensions of life. 
I also publish as a co-editor, uh, founding co-editor of an annual report called the World Happiness Report, which uses data collected by Gallup International to assess the subjective assessment of life in more than 150 countries. The reason I mention all of this is Europe has by far the highest living standards on the planet, by far. The highest quality of life, by far. And is most attuned of any region in the world to reducing inequalities, to green transformation, to doing the things we should be doing in the 21st century. That's Europe's vocation, a continent of peace, sustainable development, social equity. That's the genius of the OSCE, that that Europe extends all the way to the Urals. I was advisor to President Gorbachev. I knew President Gorbachev. He believed in a common European home not as some pernicious gimmick, because he really believed in it. And he was a great man of peace, probably the greatest statesman of our age. And the United States could not understand him. They could not take yes for an answer. He's offering peace. What's the trick? He's offering peace. Oh, I get it. We'll be the unipolar world. He's offering to disband the militaries. I get it. We'll extend NATO all the way to the Caucasus. That's the U.S. reaction to the greatest opportunity we had for peace. Mm -hmm. Europe is losing its greatest achievements in this. Europe is not the junior partner of the global hegemon. Europe doesn't even have the same values as the United States. That's, by the way, literally, objectively so. We're part of the crazy Anglo-Saxon world. We're still with John Locke's libertarianism. We're still with, you don't have to help the poor, they're a burden on society. We have ideas that go back to 17th century Britain, and then we learned from 19th century Britain what global empire means, and decided that that's what our vocation was. Europe is so much better than what it is signing up for right now. This is extremely sad and extremely dangerous. By the way, I understand Poland's sentiments. I was their main economic advisor. I helped them cancel their debts in 1990 and 91. I helped them stabilize their economy. I was their biggest champion for becoming members of the European Union. By the way, it wasn't even the Union then. It was the European community when I started the campaign. I, was, I wrote their first reform program, and I was told that the theme is the return to Europe. That's the instruction I was given by Lech Wałęsa's team. You write a plan for the economic return to Europe. So I've seen all of this. I can understand their Russophobia. I don't accept it as geopolitics or as clever or as an answer. I certainly understand it. My wife was born in communist Czechoslovakia. I have no illusions about the hard attitudes, but we have to think about how we're actually going to have a safe planet. This isn't about sentiment only. It's about some knowledge of history, some ability to see the other point of view, to understand the history, even to understand the history of the Cold War. 
this country, as I emphasized, is a great lesson that is completely ignored, by the way, as all the neutral states other than Austria abandon their neutrality with such enthusiasm. Big mistake. But my point is, please, Europe is not NATO. Europe is not NATO. And if you knew how crazy it is on the other side of the Atlantic, I'm trying to tell you, <laughs> they think that their biggest important calling in the world is confrontation with China. Is that what you want to sign up for right now? Don't. Don't do it. You have the best living standards and the best values, I would say social democratic values, which even for the non-social democratic parties permeate the idea that people should be taken care of, that there should be social housing, that there should be public. We don't have universal health coverage. You sign up for those values? I wouldn't recommend it. We don't have public values. We have British laissez-faire Lockean libertarian values. I don't recommend it. By the way, it doesn't work very well. I live in an expensive neighborhood in New York that is absolutely filled with beggars, filled with garbage that is not taken care of because the public spaces don't work, and now filled with shootings. Don't do it. And that is an approach that is part of this, even as we're falling apart internally, because we have a mass shooting almost every day, it seems, sometimes more. Even as this is happening, we're all about war. And when we just had our debt negotiations, you know what the bipartisan agreement was? That the social spending is capped but the military spending is allowed to rise, even though we're spending three times more than China, and even though we are spending more than the next 10 countries in the world combined, and even though we have 800 military bases overseas around the world. Don't sign up for that. Europe is different from NATO. But at, at the moment, it doesn't seem like that because, of course, you said Europe's vocation. Europe's vocation is, of course, effective multilateralism. But what we are moving towards, it's a polarization. So some call it a, a multipolar world, but the multipolar world without multilateralism is very dangerous. We had multipolar worlds before the first uh, and the second uh, world war. So how, my question would be, how could multilateralism be regained? So to combine it to Russia, should a European security system be constructed with Russia, without Russia, or against Russia? Should Russia be integrated in a multilateral world? And how would we do it? So you mentioned the OSCE. Would the CEC of 75 be an uh, example? So how could a multilateral world without polarization or without too much polarization uh, look like? Do you have any models, ideas? I was very keen on the European Union enlargement and played a major role in it in the early years because I believe that neighbors should cooperate with each other. And so I really like the OSCE framework. I think it's right, and I think it is proper for Europe to have a European security arrangement. All over the world, the regions are divided internally. Typically, Cold War divisions, often on a strategy, imperial U.S. strategy of uh, impera et divide. So we want division. 
The U.S. is stoking divisions in Northeast Asia. China, Japan is on our side. I'm sorry, uh, Japan and Korea are on our side. Uh, China's on the other side. We're forging a new, uh, a new military alliance, uh, AUKUS, as you know, which is Australia, U.S., U.K. for nuclear submarines in uh, Australia. Just what we need. Just what Australia needs. Uh, what the solution is, each region should cooperate. And African Union should cooperate internally. Europe should, of course, aim to include Russia. Of course, are you kidding? How could it not be other than to fall under the nuclear threat day by day again? So all of this cancel culture is mind boggling in how wrong headed it is. By the way, even the New York Philharmonic canceled a Rachmaninoff concert for May. You can't even imagine how, I mean, I could never imagine how crude this is. This is high culture. They can't figure out to play Rachmaninoff and that that's okay. Or there were protests about Tchaikovsky, about don't play Sleeping Beauty at Christmas time. Even here, it was an issue. Please. What is more beautiful than Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty? Maybe a few Strauss waltzes also. Okay, I would say that they're right up there. But we should not be behaving this way. And the demonization makes nobody safe. It solves no problems. It puts everybody on a hair trigger. And we are in a nuclear age. And so this is my basic idea is UN charter and regional cooperation and globally agreed goals sustainable development goals, Paris Climate Agreement, UN Convention on the Law of the Seas, the High Seas Treaty, the Kunming Montreal Biodiversity Framework. In other words, let's actually take care of people and the planet instead of the $2.2 trillion spent last year on military armaments. If we could get a bit of that to get kids in school, we'd make a much better world for the hundreds of millions of children who are not in school because their governments are too broke to be able to afford high schools for them. So this is what we should be doing. We actually have globally agreed goals. We have the OSCE. We have the means to do this. US politicians should not fly to Taiwan and declare that we're going to defend Taiwan at all costs. We had agreed 50 years ago to a one China, one China policy. And that's the right policy. And China believes in that because starting in 1839, the Western imperialist powers, followed by Japan, tried to destroy China on several occasions or to conquer China. So they're not too keen on that happening again. I understand that. We should have some prudence. So we're not so far away from a peaceful world because the vast majority of people in the world want it. And we don't really have, China, by the way, is not aiming to take over the world. That's another long evening. I have gone to China for 42 years, many times a year on many cases. It's the last thing in the world that I'm worried about is China taking over the world. It's not even a, a category. In 2,000 years of Chinese statecraft, China has not launched one overseas war. 2,000 years. 
The one that you could count is when the Mongols controlled Beijing and launched a, an invasion of Japan in, I think, 1274, though I may have the date wrong, and the kamikaze winds, a typhoon, defeated the Mongol fleet. Other than that, never. You know, Britain and France fought with each other almost every year for a thousand years one way or another, but Japan and China never, except Japan invading China on three occasions, not, never China invading Japan. So don't worry so much about China. Really don't. Nice place, good food, fascinating culture. Go have a visit. All right. So bef before, before, before I ask you the last, the very last question, I just want to add to, uh, to your observation that was China, Taiwan, in the last uh, survey of the European Council of Foreign Relations, which is a transatlantic uh, think tank. Uh, there was a poll asking citizens, not government, citizens of the European Union, uh, if it comes to a conflict between the US and China over Taiwan, 65% of the Europeans would say, 60 to 65% would say, they rather would stay neutral instead of siding with China or even siding with the US. So European citizens might think differently uh, than their governments. But I cannot <coughs> avoid asking this very last question now because you're sitting here as an American and you uh, also wrote a piece about the link between war and debt. And uh, debt is accumulating uh, in uh, the US and uh, in the US, there will be elections uh, next uh, year. So will the debt crisis have an impact on the decision to support, support uh, Ukraine uh, by the next government? Um, US, US politics is basically uh, a plutocratic state uh, where public policy has been taken over by uh, several powerful lobbies, each one devoted to its specific area. And they keep the control over US policy through campaign contributions because our election campaigns are uh, funded by billionaires and by corporate lobbies and they cost about $15 billion now for an election cycle. And you may have seen George Soros yesterday said, uh, I give my empire to my son. And the son said, I'm going to fund the Democratic Party. <clears throat> well, that's the billionaires that he'll put in hundreds of millions of dollars, a billion dollars would not be surprising. Uh, in the 2024 election. And then there are other billionaires. And so what are the lobbies? Wall Street controls financial policy and our health lobby controls uh, our unbelievably expensive private so-called health system. And our ag lobby controls the food industry with about 60% obesity or, or overweight in the United States, another huge, ser very serious public health crisis. And the military industrial complex controls foreign policy, not just military policy, foreign policy. So we have perpetual war and trillion dollar military budgets, 900 billion in the Pentagon budget, but there's a lot more. There's the CIA and there's Homeland Security and there are many other categories, Department of Energy with nuclear weapons and so on. It's maybe $1.2 trillion a year. So that's on the spending side. On the revenue side, we have unanimous agreement among the billionaires. Don't tax us. It's very simple. So we have a low tax collection in the United States, 
and uh, this spending on the uh, military, for example, which has cost about six trillion dollars in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and some of the other wars. Tr six trillion, it's a lot, by the way. It starts to add up a little bit. And so our debt crisis comes from a broken political system. It's not so interesting, Democrats and Republicans, by the way. That's a little bit a children's game. The oligarchy is, the plutocracy is both parties. And I, I lost interest in the because it's basically a game that is below our intelligence. Uh, and this is our problem. Now, we will have rising debt in the future. It's a big country, big economy. We can spend a lot on wars. What There's been no public debate for a moment on the $120 billion that has been spent so far. This has all been just bits and pieces inside omnibus legislation. So we can't get a debate on anything because there is no debate. There'll, there'll have to be another appropriation for Ukraine. They'll try to put it in a must-pass bill so that it's not really debated and can just be snuck in because there's no interest in asking the American people anything about any of this. There's no attempt at deliberative democracy at all. No debate at all. So the answer to the question is I'm not sure because there probably has to be another vote, but they will try to make the vote so that nobody notices uh, and it's just part of some omnibus legislation that funds Social Security something or other. It's not, won't be Social Security, but it'll be something that has to pass and it'll just get through. That's how it's done in general. If it came to an actual vote, it would probably be defeated. Uh, if, if there was actually a debate in Congress do we really want to spend another 50 or 100 billion dollars on this? It would probably lose. They know that, but they have the convenience of avoiding any kind of public debate. <laughs>